Hello everybody uh, and welcome to Facebook Friday. Um, it is Friday, it's the 19th of February 2021 and <laughs> I have to tell you before I start I did get a frantic text message from someone yesterday um, to say oh the video is not working <laughs> and I absolutely had a nightmare but um, but it's okay because today is Friday so that's all good. Um, I'm Kate Wakelin, I'm from Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia, I'm the Net Patient Support Nurse and every Friday um, uh, we hop in live to I guess focus on topic of the week and give everybody a bit of, a bit of an update about neuroendocrine cancers. So thanks everybody for joining me and um, before I go any further, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm broadcasting to you from, which is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I would just like to take this opportunity to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. One of the things I know lots of people know about me is that I love to go running along the Yarra River, which in the Woiwurrung language is called the Birrung. So um, uh, I've been able to do that a little bit more freely um, over the last couple of days because the lockdown in Melbourne has eased and so if and, and Victoria. So if you're from Victoria, um, you may be noticing an increased sense of freedom, although for all of us um, around Australia and indeed worldwide, there is still this concern about um, COVID and its ongoing impact. Um, we're all waiting for news about the vaccine and I have got some... Um, uh, information to bring to you about information coming so i don't have a lot of information about vex vaccines today but um there's a couple of things happening in the next couple of weeks that will hopefully leave us feeling a lot more clear about all of this um within our neuroendocrine cancer community so today the topic was um up in the air for quite some time as i waited for some feedback from some people about what you would like to hear from um, me about and one of the suggestions that came forward was actually really probably quite a well I decided it was a good one because it's been a long time since I've talked about the basics of neuroendocrine cancers and neuroendocrine tumors um, and uh, so I think it's probably worthwhile trying to trying to cover some of that you know like nets 101 um because uh, look a, a lot of people say being diagnosed with a neuroendocrine cancer is being like being told that um you need to fly to another country that you've never been to before and they speak a different language that you've never heard spoken before and you have to navigate their public transport system with a map that is all in the other person's language that you know that doesn't make any sense to you because you don't understand the modes of transport even on the map so um there's so much to get your head around when you're new to neuroendocrine tumors and actually even when you've been doing this a long time there's a constant learning program um, a learning tra trajectory for everybody um and certainly not a day goes by where i don't learn something new about neuroendocrine cancers so um, my challenge that I'm setting to myself today is not to tell you everything I know because sometimes I feel like um, I just want to tell you the next thing because it's all really quite um, important and fascinating but I realize that um, breaking some information down into chunks can be really helpful too especially if you're new to the scene so that's my aim if you feel like I'm rambling on today too much then put a note in the comments um, so I wanted to, yeah, so today is just around the basics of neuroendocrine tumours or neuroendocrine cancers or neuroendocrine neoplasms or some of you may have heard them being called carcinoid tumours. So there's, as I said, you know, it's not only that you're speaking a different language in a new country, it's like everybody's got a different word for the same thing. So that's even more confusing. Um, so net basics. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about the neuroendocrine system because I think probably this is um, a system in our body that it's a bit like the way I feel about my car in that most of the time I'm not really sure how it works. Uh, I just know that when I hop in and I press the, I, I put my key in the ignition and I turn the key and I, I put it into drive and drive down the driveway that the steering wheel should point in a particular direction and the mirror should show me where I'm going and there's all of this magical stuff under the bonnet, bonnet that um, some of you would be able to tell me a great deal about but actually like beyond checking the oil and the water and um, really importantly the water fluid 
it's something that I don't pay a lot of attention to and I don't even think about it working as I drive the car, um, driving my teenagers around um, to their various things. So I think often our neuroendocrine systems are like that. Um, when they're working well, we're not aware of them really at all. You might become aware of your neuroendocrine system if uh, an example was uh, my husband likes watching random YouTube videos and sometimes I walk into the lounge room and I see him, there's there's some YouTube videos that are about dash cam recordings which I just think is, is awful. Like who wants to subject yourself to the trauma of watching a car crash when it's, you know, you don't have to. But anyway, some things, who knows, my family, you know, who can, there's no accounting for taste. But um. Uh, I was, I, I'd walked into the lounge room the other night and he was watching the dash cam footage and my eyes drifted to the TV as they do and this person came a cropper with a truck um, and my every muscle in my body contracted before I even knew that it, I was watching it all that it had happened and then my heart was racing um, my mouth went dry I, I, I started to feel really jittery and shaky um, not my car accident, just I knew that it was a video on a screen, but um, I had this really physical reaction to watching this on my screen. And it took about probably 10 to 20 minutes to settle down to the point where I could sort of wander off to bed and leave him to his weird YouTube video <laughs> habits, um, which is, yeah. So, and, and that was my body producing a burst of adrenaline. And it's, it's, instantaneous that our body's neuroendocrine cells respond to these signals and they're responding to neurological symptoms um, neurological signals which is why there's the neuro in neuroendocrine because it's your hormones your endocrine on endocrine system the hormones that are produced in response to a body signal the other time you might find yourself becoming aware of your neuroendocrine system is if you're very lucky and someone else is cooking you dinner and they're in the other room and you can smell I don't know frying chicken or sizzling onions or someone's neighbor's barbecue even sometimes and you find that your your mouth is watering and your stomach starts grumbling and um, it's getting ready your whole system is getting ready to digest this food that um, that may or may not be coming but the body's getting ready and you, you don't even think about oh that smells like food maybe it's time to eat soon it's not a conscious thing it's just your body's actually just doing it all of its own a bit like the way my car engine when it's working well works without me even knowing about it or thinking um so there's neuroendocrine cells in all over your all over your body and we often think of adrenaline glands or some of us will be aware of our pancreas or our, you know our salivary glands but actually we've got neuroendocrine cells and cells that produce minute amounts of hormones in response to those neurological sim, sim, um, signals right from our brain right down to our bum we've got them on our skin we've got them they line our lungs um, they certainly line our digestive system and then there are organs that have them as well so um, it, it's it's really again it's like it's quite like my car I had no idea any of this was inside me until I started to really delve so what happens to cause a normal neuroendocrine cell going about its business, working well. How does that become cancer? And that I think is like the million dollar question that we would so like to know the answer to. Very rarely there is an inherited syndrome that, um, that, that means that you might be at more risk of passing a gene on to subsequent um, children and, and grandchildren and things. That's actually very rare in NETS. So it's about five, maybe 10% of people with NETS have an inherited gene. Um, and it happens in particular types of NETS and we see patterns in those. So you might have heard people talk about MEN1 or MEN2. There's actually like lots and lots and lots of different genetic mutations um, that, that uh, have been identified but they're all very rare um, and they're more common in some of our uh, less common neuroendocrine cancers like pheochromocytomas, 
paragangliomas. Sometimes we see collections of um, tumour types within the one person and that makes us really wonder whether there might be a genetic syndrome. For example, um, anyone who has a medullary, medullary thyroid cancer, it's different from your normal thyroid cancer, but medullary thyroid cancer, they're... Um, they have a fairly reasonable rate of, of being a syndrome. So we sort of offer genetic testing to anyone who's had a medullary thyroid cancer. Um, and sometimes there's, um, for example, MEN1, you're likely to get pituitary and parathyroid and pancreatic tumours. That's like the three Ps. I'm not going to go into that in great detail, although I just have. Um, that's my challenge to myself. Just keep telling me if I'm wafting off track. So what are neuroendocrine cancers as opposed to just normal neuroendocrine cells? So as I said, it's just a really small proportion. There's a genetic inherited um, difference that means that you're more likely to get um, tumours growing in your neuroendocrine tissue. But actually most people, the vast majority of people who have NETS, there's no identified genetic mutation that you've had passed on through your family. And what that means is, or we call that sporadic, rather than genetic. Um, and what it means is actually there's been a random mutation in a cell within your neuroendocrine system. And we know actually these sorts of mutations in our bodies are relatively common. Um, we have exposure to what we know as carcinogens. You know, from the minute we're born, we're, um, you know, uh, certainly environmentally, there's things like cigarette smoke, there's alcohol that we know is a carcinogen, um, the pollution in the air, the chemicals, you know, there's suspicions about some of the chemicals that our fruit and veggies are, um, are grown with. And a lot of people go to great lengths to avoid exposure to these environmental carcinogens. Some of you still manage to end up with a, a neuroendocrine cancer or a different sort of cancer, which is, um, you know, so avoiding these things only goes so far and it just seems that maybe the older our bodies get the more fragile the dna or the genetic material in our cells is and the more likely that there might be just a break in that dna or a mutation that might mean that there's um, a tumor starts to grow and what happens is you start with one tumor cell that's got a mutation and instead of it behaving like a or being told to behave like a normal neuroendocrine cell it's, there's some weird signal in that cell net that now tells us, tells it, it needs to make new cells and make lots of new cells and make them much more quickly than the body really needs. In neuroendocrine tissue, in neuroendocrine cancers, it also can result in those cells getting the idea that they need to produce lots of hormone and they lose the ability to really be able to tell whether or not um, the body needs the hormone. <laughs> Like, you know, do I need to run from a bear? Maybe I don't need all of that adrenaline running around my body. Or have I just had a big meal? Maybe I don't need all of that insulin pumping into my body. So it sort of loses its ability to kind of self-regulate, makes lots of new cells. And the new cells become a lump. The new cells have grown from a cell with a mutation. All of the baby cells have got that mutation too. So they're all growing new cells and you get what's essentially a lump. But what can happen with cancer we know is that that can that can grow and spread to other parts in the body and that's where we can run into some real issues the body actually we think is really good at clearing a lot of these cells that might have a mutation in them so um probably i've got cells that are mutating right now and my body's immune system is is you know tidying those up with its immune system what we're not really sure of and some you know there's a lot of research going into this is to well, what happens with a, a cancer cell where the body's immune system doesn't recognize it and actually that's a lot of the bedrock behind you um immunotherapy i'm not even going to go there today but we might look a bit more at immunotherapy on another time um, and pick it as its own topic because immunotherapy is has been really exciting we've got a long way to go with neuroendocrine tumors and immunotherapy so i'd love to pin an expert down for a chat um, a bit more about that down the track so neuroendocrine tumors have grown out of neuroendocrine cells and they have a lot of the same characteristics as neuroendocrine healthy neuroendocrine cells but they've lost their ability to you know know when to call it a day and not make new cells so they've made themselves into a lump that can grow and spread but they also may be um, squirting out way more hormone than your body needs um, 
you might have heard of these tumors being called carcinoid tumors in the past that's an old term where um, we're steadily gaining traction with the with the medical community who learned to speak their language you know several decades ago and and kudos to them they know a great deal and they're very wise um, but but sometimes they still call them carcinoid tumors so we just kind of um, gently remind them that actually neuroendocrine tumors or actually the technically correct word is neuroendocrine neoplasm so you know but neuroendocrine tumors will do um, uh, so Carcinoid is an old term. It gets a bit confused because um, there's this thing called carcinoid syndrome, um, which is a bunch of symptoms that can occur with particular types of nets. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more another week too. So I'm setting myself lots of homework to come back to in, in future weeks. I can see there's a couple of little comments there. And so I'm just going to have a little quick look. Um, can your body produce enough adrenaline to cause a carcinoid crisis? Like if you were in a car accident or skydiving. So your body can produce enough hormone to make you very, very, very sick. And that can be life-threatening. I did do a talk ages ago about carcinoid crisis, um, uh, which I might have another look at and see if I need to, you know, do a refresher. Um, but I'll put a link in the notes about carcinoid crisis as well. Um, Sometimes that can be stimulated be because of physical stimulation. Here I am going down the rabbit hole of carcinoid crisis, but, but it's very basically, it can be in response to a physical stimulus. So, for example, an, an injection of adrenaline. Um, some people, if they've had surgery or dental work, that can cause a carcinoid crisis if their tumours are particularly kind of hormone producing. But some people, if you've got, um, particularly people with pheochromocytomas, so if they've got adrenaline producing tumours, if they get a shock or get really upset about things, that can give them physical symptoms from their tumour because their tumours are kind of going out and sympathy and producing heaps of hormone. Um, so it won't, it, it depends on where those tumours grew from as to which hormone they produce. So, for example, in your, if you've got tumours in your pancreas, they're more, much more likely to produce insulin. Your pancreas doesn't really produce adrenaline, as far as I know. But, um, you know, so but the, the tumours in the um, pancreas might produce insulin, they might produce glucagon, um, they might produce um, other things. Um, adrenaline Tumor, adrenal tumors are much more likely to produce adrenaline. So the depending on where the tumor grows, depends then affects which um, which hormones are secreted. I'm trying not to get myself too tight in knots here, and um, I don't know. Anyway, I think the the other thing that I'm really import that, that that I really want to emphasize is that neuroendocrine tumors, because they grow in all sorts of different places within the network of cells in our body that are neuroendocrine. And they've got lots of different jobs um, but we can also have lots of different types of mutation so it's an umbrella term neuroendocrine tumors is an umbrella term for a massive range of different cancers that behave really differently i was actually talking to a guy this morning who um, found out about his neuroendocrine cancer late last year and he was really confused because he had been told that um, a, that it was neuroendocrine carcinoma rather than a neuroendocrine tumour. He'd been told that it was um, a fast-growing tumour. He'd also been told that it's a slow-growing tumour. So neuroendocrine tumours can be any of that. They can include um, very, very slow-growing tumours. And I've got, you know, like my, my longest um, diagnosed patient, I love to tell this story, was diagnosed in 1984 and I was in year seven and I've got plenty of gray hair so 1984 was a long time ago so you can get um, tumors that are way down the very slow growing end of things but we can get neuroendocrine tumors that grow and spread very quickly and they can be very aggressive and because of this range they respond to lots of different treatments so when you're talking with other people with neuroendocrine cancers, it's really important to remember that just because someone else is having a treatment that you're not having doesn't mean your doctor's got it wrong or that their doctor's got it wrong or that anyone is on the wrong treatment of any sort. It probably means that your tumour is different from their tumour. Um, but I think the waters get really muddy and because lots of health professionals don't know a lot about these tumours also. So I think sometimes we've actually got 
we do have good reasons to question our health professionals and make sure that they're on the right track and when appropriate get a second opinion ask for a referral to a multidisciplinary team that's specialized in nets but at the end of the day it may just be that their treatment's different because their cancer's different um, and I've used this a metaphor before and I know that um, a lot of people relate to it and I certainly relate to it and and that is that I think having a neuroendocrine tumor is a bit like saying you've got a dog um, you might have a, a, a little yappy poodle like my parents have in the country that you know every time anyone walks past the front of the house it's yapping its head off um, I, I love her dearly but you know sorry the yapping Oof. so you know you might have a small yappy tumor of a dog or you might have uh, a, a, a hulking Labrador that's just s s lazy and sleeps beside you on the couch every evening um, or you might have one of those slightly mischievous Labradors that you think is just gonna sleep on the couch and be lazy but actually it's out the back pulling all the washing off the line. So even when you've got a particular breed of dog, you don't really know how that dog's going to behave until you get to know that dog. Um, you can't get to know a dog within five minutes, although you can get some clues. Um, but sometimes you've got to live with that dog for a little while to actually really get to know what the nature of that dog is. And neuroendocrine tumors are really, really similar in that you can kind of look at a, um, a low or what might look like a low grade neuroendocrine tumor um, and think, well, probably that's going to grow fairly slowly but it might be actually more likely to produce hormones so that's another thing it's like the 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 the, the cloud to the silver lining the slow growing tumor is often they're very very symptomatic and make you really sick um so we know that generally about grade one tumors or and i'll talk about grade another week too um we know that generally about tumors that are seen to be low grade but sometimes we didn't see all, we, we, a, a pathologist can't look under the microscope at all of the cells in that tumour and there might have been an area in that tumour that actually had some slightly higher grade cells in it that are growing more quickly. So we're getting to know the personality of your tumour and that's why people with even tumours that have been sta you know, seemingly stable for a long time, we still send you for regular scans and I know that's stressful and really difficult. Um, to live with because it can feel like there's like the sort of, Dam is it Damocles? Um, where you feel like, gosh, you're just waiting for this thing to grow and sometimes it's decades and it's not doing anything but we still want to monitor that um, because it can, they can change. They can actually have, you can get a mutation within a mutation so they can actually change what they're doing. We need to keep an eye on them. Um, one thing that I learned about neuroendocrine tumours really early in my, um, in my specialisation was that just when you think you've got it down pat and you've worked out the rule with neuroendocrine tumors, they'll go and break it. They'll go and be different because it's like the I'm I'm an individual Monty Python sketch where they're going, no, I'm not. Um, you know, so so we do watch them carefully even when they're seemingly very low grow uh, slow growing. Um, so where can they grow? Well, they can grow really anywhere from your head to your bum and even the skin on your legs is not immune so um, they, they certainly are, are you know we see them commonly for an uncommon cancer but we see them commonly in the digestive system so a lot of you who are watching may have had a tumor that's been um, diagnosed in the bowel uh, some people get it growing in the pancreas so they're two common kind of spots um, certainly also you can get them growing in your lungs so they're sort of three more common sites but you know you I was talking to a person very recently who their tumor was growing in their esophagus um, you can get them all the way through the digestive system so rectal net nets um, certainly come up and as I mentioned you can actually get them growing on your skin so Merkel cell carcinoma is a neuroendocrine cancer that's very rare um, but yes, yeah, still under that umbrella of um, neuroendocrine cancers um, what did I want to say? You can get them growing in more than one spot. So this is the weird thing about neuroendocrine cancers is that you can get um, tumors that look quite different growing in different locations and sometimes the jury can be sort of out as to whether um, the tumor has started in one spot and then mutated on the way to where it's spread to or whether you've been super unlucky and had two individual tumors growing in separate places 
Sometimes it can be difficult to tell. Sometimes people have tumours both in their bowel and their pancreas and we can't work out which is the primary. And sometimes people come and they we find that they have neuroendocrine cancer that's um, metastatic, so it's in uh, another organ that doesn't normally grow it to start with. So for example, the liver or the bones. Sometimes we can't find the primary and that's really tricky. We don't really have a good explanation for what's happening there. Because once we find a neuroendocrine tumour, usually if we can cut it out, we'll cut it out because that's much better than leaving it in and waiting for it to grow. Um, so we don't know what happens long term sometimes with these tumours if they just if we don't find them. The theory is that we think that perhaps the primary tumour might be slightly more easy for the body to identify and for the immune system to clear it up as opposed to a secondary tumour. Um, but that it is a theory. At the end of the day, it's a theory. It's a it's a mysterious thing. But yes, yeah, sometimes we don't find the, the primary. It doesn't mean that your team has been negligent or not looking carefully enough. Um, people can have scan after scan after scan, biopsy after biopsy after biopsy, and never find the primary. Um, so we treat what we see. Um, and, and you can't treat what you can't see. But if you can see it, you can treat it. Um, so the thing I wanted to just really just recap on um, briefly before I finish up was the, this concept of a primary tumour and a secondary tumour. So you might remember, um, you know, when I started, I was talking about a mutation in a neuroendocrine cell and that um, growing and potentially a piece of that tumour. Um, so some cells from that tumour can break off and they can spread. We think it's often in the lymphatic system, but sometimes it can be in the bloodstream and, it, and set up like a, a subcamp in a different location. So that sometimes is very close to where the tumour um, started. So it might be in a lymph node. You might get a small collection of cells in a lymph node, but it can also be further afield. One of the things that people really wonder about is that um, when we look at the scans from people with neuroendocrine tumours, they can, you, PET scans can look like a Dalmatian, speaking of dog breeds, you know, it can, you can have a lot of tumour and a lot of bulk of tumour. Sometimes people ask me, well, how can this be? How can I still be alive and have this much in my body? And it's really interesting, but it, it does really um, depend a lot on how fast those tumours are growing and, and spreading as to how we go with this. So the same looking PET scan uh, on a person with a very quick growing cancer, they might be a lot sicker than if it was a slow growing cancer. So particularly when, I'm, when we're talking about liver metastases, if those liver metastases are growing really slowly, the liver is super clever at regenerating and it will grow more, it will adapt, it will grow more, It'll the, 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 the liver surrounding the cancer will get a little bit more efficient and it's actually quite incredible how well our bodies work in the presence of what on a scan can look like overwhelming amounts of disease. So um, that's just an answer to a question that I do get asked from time to time about um, the primary tumour and the, and secondary tumour. So essentially secondary is where it's grown elsewhere in the body. Sometimes we don't find the, pr the primary as I mentioned. So um, I'm just going to have a very quick look through the notes and see if there's anything, um, any other questions that I can quickly answer today. Otherwise I'm really happy for you to make comments and tell me what you would like um, covered during our Facebook Friday chats. It's only useful if it's useful for you. Um, the concept started, it's actually almost a year, I think it's a year next week since we started these videos and we thought actually probably we might just do them for a few weeks and see um, if, if it was, you know, if it seemed to get any interest but actually it got quite a lot of interest and I guess the concept was that I get asked these questions every day and so I might give the same explanation about primary and secondary tumours or different types of nets or nets that grow in pancreases or nets that grow in small bowels. I might give that um, explanation to lots of people through the week. So doing Facebook Friday was just, I guess, an opportunity to give that explanation to more than just one person at a time and then maybe that would be useful um, as a bit of a developing a little bit of a library of, of knowledge around neuroendocrine tumours. So look, thank you to everybody who has 
provided um, positive feedback and encouragement about them. Um, I'm still nowhere near an expert in doing these and I'm very much here for learning. Um, I still have got to get more concise. But if there are topics that you would like me to cover and also if, if there's things that I have touched on but you think, gosh, I'd really like a refresher on that. I wonder if there's anything new. Let me know. Um, so our next couple of weeks, we've actually got some exciting things in the pipeline. Uh, and there's actually a question here. How do I know if the tumor was a primary is a primary or not? So I might actually see if I can tackle that before um, before I go on to talking about next week's Facebook Fridays. Um, often they can tell, especially with the lower grade tumors. So lower grade. I'm going to talk about grade another week. I promise. But essentially, lower grade tumors. Um, the lower the grade of the tumor, the more similar to the original neuroendocrine cell the tumor looks under the microscope. So if a neuroendocrine um, tumor in the pancreas is very low grade, it will look under the microscope like a pancreas cell. And sometimes it's about the, the hormones that they're producing as well. So if you've got a tumor that's producing insulin, it's not going to be from any other part in the body except for the pancreas. Um, so uh, how did they know if the tumor was a primary or not? The other thing is that there we, we have our usual suspects in terms of where the sites of metastases are. So it's very, very, very rare to get primary liver cancer. And it's usually not a neuroendocrine cancer um, if it's a primary liver cancer. So if you've got spots in your liver, we go looking for a primary because it's 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 almost unheard of that you get a neuroendocrine tumor that starts in the liver. Um, the bones are another place where we don't get the tumors starting classically, but it's a common place where they spread. So it depends on the location. It depends on what they look like under the microscope. And sometimes it's just a, you know educated guesswork and some like, well, we're not really sure, but it's got these characteristics under the microscope. Let's treat you know, based on those characteristics. So, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so next couple of weeks. The first, uh, next week, um, we actually have one of our consumer advisory group members who's joining me um, in Facebook Friday. Her name is Amanda and she's been on that advisory committee for several years. She's got a really amazing story. Um, in terms of her experience with NETS and I'm really um, excited that she'll be able to tell us some of that um, next week. But the other thing that Amanda has been working or been engaging with is uh, an international um, organisation called INCA and INCA stands for the International um, Neuroendocrine Cancer Alliance and it's, um, as you might imagine, it's international. And what they've been doing over the past few months is what they've called INCA Boot Camp. Uh, which is um, when they, uh, it is a bunch of consumers, so people who have experienced neuroendocrine cancers from all around the world, uh, and they've been doing some training for those people in both in terms of, you know, some stuff around neuroendocrine cancers and how it all works, but also about advocacy. And as we all know, this is a, a, a really important part of neuroendocrine cancers um uh, goals and, and remit, you know, it's an important pillar for us is this advocacy work. So, you know, making sure that we're fighting for better funding and services and treatments and, and experiences, care for net people people with NETS. Um, so Amanda's been engaged in that uh, boot camp. She was one of the people selected to be part of that boot camp over the last few months. So I'm really looking forward to interviewing Amanda next week. Um, the, the, the other thing that I wanted to plug was the following week that we're really, really pleased that um, Associate Professor uh, Patrick Charles, well, I nearly said Patrick Butler, but Pat, Patrick Charles. Patrick Charles is a, um, a infectious diseases consultant uh, and he has um, been actually very active in the COVID space. He has a YouTube channel, which I might share that in the notes because that might be interesting. Um, but we've managed to get Patrick to agree to come on board um, and not to scare him too, much, him too much with a Facebook Friday chat about COVID, about COVID vaccines and about cancer and COVID. So I'm really, really excited that he's um, agreed and that will be on the 5th of March. Regarding COVID, um, before that time, you might have seen if you're in our Facebook private discussion group, there is actually a webinar that's being presented next week in Australia. Now it's not from us, 
uh, it's it's from a private cancer um, treatment center so I don't know very much at all about the the quality of the speakers or the information that's going to be presented but it's a fairly well-known um, center and I suspect that it's going to be really interesting and useful it's not neuroendocrine cancer specific but look what we've learned about neuroendocrine cancers and COVID is that um, it's pretty reasonable to look at the wisdom that we've gained from other sorts of cancers and we can apply that to neuroendocrine cancers. Um, so I will make sure I put the link to that webinar in the notes as well. I think that's on Tuesday next, oh no, Monday next week. Um, on Tuesday next week, we've got our online open national Zoom group meeting. So this is a, a group that again emerged over COVID um, and particularly with a focus of pe for people in uh, regional areas that wouldn't maybe be able to come to a face-to-face -face support group if in, even if they were meeting face-to-face, -face. but people who would find it difficult to get to a face-to-face -face group. It's open to anyone in our um, private discussion group on Facebook. Now, if you're watching this video on YouTube, you're not a Facebook person, and look, quite frankly, who could blame you this week, um, maybe get in touch with me and we can see if we can link you in separately because I'm quite open to that idea. I just need to make sure I can organize it and make sure we're communicating with the right people at the right days. But um, get in touch with me if you're interested in taking part in that live chat. Um, it's using webcams and microphones so we get to see each other's faces and hear each other's voices um, even though we're not in the same room. And it's um, Melbourne time, so Victorian time, it's between 6.30 in the evening and 8 o'clock next Tuesday evening. Uh, what else did I need to tell you? Oh, just a little update about somatostatin analogues. And I'm going to come back to this because um, there's some changes in the pipeline, which we really, really want to make sure that you've got um, information as quickly as possible about. But um, you, if you're um, on land retired and you've been on the Assist Beyond program, you might have heard a whisper that they're doing what corporations tend to do, which is a rebrand. So they will now be called Ipsen Assist. And I don't know how many years it's going to take for me to um, learn the new name, but uh, that's just so you know that if you hear Ipsen Assist, uh, that's the new name for Assist Beyond. So I think it's, you know, same product, different packaging, um, you know, same home injection support, home injection support service, um, being able to get a nurse to come in and teach you how to use um, your product at home. So that's the little bit of news about that. The other bit of news that's just in the pipeline, again, I don't know when this is going to be happening, but um, there has been approval given in Australia by the Therapeutic Goods Association. Um, Therapeutic Goods Association, I'm fairly sure that's the right word. I'm having a mental blank. Um, uh, uh, regarding somatostatin analogues, so these are the monthly slow-acting versions of octreotide and there's lanreotide and there's santostatin la are the two in existence at the moment in Australia. The um, What happens with drugs in Australia is that after a certain number of years, um, for for the first number of years, and I don't know how many years it is, someone might be able to tell me, the the, manuf the drug company who um, discover it and, and market it, they have the ability to be the only person who gives, who, who supplies that version of that drug. After a set amount of time, it's called coming off patent and it means that other pharmaceutical companies can um, take the formula for that drug and make it themselves and it might be um, a, a slightly different packaging or a slightly different form but essentially it's meant to be the same drug from a, at a molecular level. Um, so what's happened with octreotide, with the long-acting octreotide, is that it's come off patent and that means that the people who make lanreotide and um, sandostatin LAR uh, no longer have like the monopoly on these drugs or the, the long-acting octreotide in Australia um, and there's going to be a generic version. Um, now usually um, these generic versions are slightly lower cost so I don't know if you've ever bought Ventolin over the counter but you can get ve well, Ventolin, um, Salbutamol is the actual name of the drug and the, the, the first manufacturers were called, called it Ventolin so that's what we're all in the habit of calling it but if you go to the pharmacy and ask for Ventolin they might say would you be happy with a generic version of that drug and you can get Asmol and there's a few different brands that still ostensibly contain Ventolin. With somatostatin analogues, 
we do have some questions about having a generic version available and I think the most important thing from our perspective as a as a, um, a charity supporting people with nets in Australia is we want to make sure that you've got all the information we can give you so that you can make informed decisions um, and talk with your doctor you've got the questions to ask with your doctor and your pharmacy about what's best for you and what might be the implications of a change or, or a change you know, so um, so this is all to say watch this space as soon as there is more information about this generic um, version I will get it to you as quickly as I can um, uh, I'm actually hoping I'll be able to get a pharmacist to come along and talk about the various versions of these drugs um, so don't hold your breath because it's not happening next week but but it, it certainly will be happening soon oh okay I have talked for 40 minutes and this was supposed to be a short one so that's um, I don't know how I went with the trying to be concise business but You've all hung in there with me, so thank you for that. Um, just a, a quick plug before I go about the direct, direct, direct net study. I did talk about this last week, so I don't want to go on about it, but it's the last few days before this study closes. It's going to give us some really important information, and it's one of those studies where we're collaborating with people worldwide. So we, um, we have the opportunity to gather um, the the thoughts from people as affected by nets like a large number of people with nets um and and it's going to shape the way that um people are communicated up to about their their treatment options i think it's really a really important piece of research it takes about 15 minutes it's an online survey um you know you could take it you could do it in, in the amount of time you could watch someone to unpack the dishwasher if you have the luxury of owning a dishwasher and having someone in your life who will unpack it so look i would really encourage you to do that i would love to blow our stats out of the water in this last few days while it's still open i'll make sure there's a link in the notes so that's where i'm going to leave you today everybody um i hope you have a good week and i know there are several people who have big appointments coming up who, um, who are having treatment right now. Um, I know several people, there's some really tough things happening. I know several in our carers group, um, you know, it's not been an easy few weeks. And so um, just a reminder, you're welcome to reach out to me um, and, you know, you know the drill, leave me a message. I may call you back that day or I might need to be the next couple of days. Facebook message is not a great way of contacting me, much better if it's over the phone or via email. Um, so I'll make sure my contact details are in the notes. Lovely to see you all today, at least um, to see your names in the little watching box. And um, yeah, keep the ideas coming for Facebook Fridays. I'm really interested to see what else you would like us to focus on. Um, so there we go. I'm going to finish up now. Have a great week and I'll see you next week.